Scott Alexander, and in this video I'm going to talk about another controversial aspect of Maimonides' thinking. The question, did Maimonides conceal a secret doctrine in the guide of the perplexed? In my commentary essays on each chapter of the first book of The Guide of the Perplexed, I attempt to dispel mistaken notions and misunderstood aspects of Maimonides' thought. Maimonides had complained in his letter on resurrection that people were taking his words out of context and saddling him with notions that he did not himself approve. One error that modern scholars tend to make is to say that Maimonides had a secret doctrine. In my view, there is no secret doctrine in the Guide of the Perplexed. I do admit, however, that there is some mild veiling in the guide. The purpose of this mild veiling is twofold. Number one, to protect the student from sophomoric error, and number two, to comply with Jewish law. Jewish law, especially in the second century Mishnah, ruled against the public teaching of what Maimonides called the divine science. That divine science includes the teaching of prophecy to future prophets, which I believe is the main purpose of the Guide of the Perplexed. None of the veils involved in this mild veiling are difficult to lift with reasonable attention to the text of the chapters of the Guide, which my commentary aims to provide. My basic premise is that Maimonides is what we nowadays call an Orthodox Jew. By an Orthodox Jew, I mean that Maimonides believed in the principles and practices of Judaism that he codified in his Mishneh Torah. This may not surprise you that Maimonides was an Orthodox Jew, but contemporary scholars have made Maimonides fit a completely different picture. While it is rare to find portrayals of Maimonides as an atheist or an agnostic or even a reformed Jew, I have heard such claims. More significantly recently, he's been made out to be a Platonist, an Aristotelian, a member of the Skeptical Academy that succeeded Plato, as well as an opponent of Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism. Others who are uncomfortable with his professed views have him opposing the restoration of the sacrificial rite in a restored temple. They would like to portray Maimonides as an opponent of creation ex nihilo, of the power of prayer, and of the providence promised to observant Jews. I reject such claims. Unfortunately, it won't be easy to dissuade those who believe that Maimonides hid anti-religious views in the God. But I think, in general, we'll find it easier to understand the guide and Maimonides' writing generally if we try to understand his outlook rather than substituting our own contemporary views. I'm not alone in holding this perspective. Professor Dr. Kenneth Seaskin who is the professor of Jewish civilization at Northwestern University, rejected the notion of a secret teaching in the guide, as has Dr. Herbert Davidson. Professor Ski Seaskin's 2005 volume, Maimonides on the Origin of the World, refuted those who portrayed Maimonides as a covert Aristotelian eternalist who rejected creation ex nihilo. The search for the secrets of the guide is old, but it was Leo Strauss who inaugurated its modern vogue. Strauss was a German-Jewish philosopher who emigrated to the United States in 1937 and eventually went on to teach at the University of Chicago. Strauss, in my view properly, urged a turn or return to ancient rationalism as an antidote to the crisis in modern philosophy, which took place when Martin Heidegger became a Nazi spokesman. 
But Strauss concluded, and I think this is the problem with Strauss, that to safely pursue philosophy under Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or any other regime, the philosopher had to conceal its radical character. He argued that philosophy's individual search for truth was at war with religion and with society's values. This was a view that Maimonides did not hold. The philosophers, for their own protection, had to practice a special literary discipline, according to Strauss. Strauss called attention to this discipline in the famous title of his 1952 essay collection, Persecution and the Art of Writing. He claimed that intentional concealment pervades the work of many philosophers. Strauss's primary source would turn out to be none other than Maimonides in the guide. Strauss argued that there were platonic doctrines concealed in the guide, particularly political doctrines. He argued that Maimonides concealed these doctrines for two reasons. Number one, to protect the philosopher from persecution, but number two, to protect the, what Plato called the, the noble lie, that is, the opinions that rulers use to rule society. Strauss insisted that the philosopher had a duty to protect society's purely conventional opinions from the inevitably dangerous results of free philosophic inquiry. The philosopher even had to repeat the noble lies to guard the political good protected by those civic institutions. All the while, the philosopher must conceal the dangerous truth in coded prose. Strauss's evidence for this was Maimonides' statement that there are, as he wrote, seven causes of inconsistencies and contradictions to be met with in a literary work. Strauss argued that those contradictions concealed a secret doctrine. Strauss, and especially the later Straussians who chafed at Maimonides' explicit doctrines, claimed that he used the system of contradictions to conceal his rejection of such typical religious commitments as creation ex nihilo, divine providence, the effectiveness of prayer, all of which tend to make professors uncomfortable. Regarding the contradictions, Maimonides wrote that the fifth cause is a certain method adopted in teaching and expounding profound problems, the teacher must content himself with giving a general, though somewhat inaccurate, notion on the subject. Later on, the same subject is thoroughly treated and rightly developed in its place. He wrote, the seventh cause is sometimes necessary to introduce such very obscure matters as may be partly disclosed and partly concealed. On one occasion, the problem is treated as solved in one way. On another occasion, the opposite way. The author must endeavor by concealing the fact as much as possible to prevent the uneducated reader from perceiving the contradiction. The modern commentator and translator of the guide, Rabbi Yosef Gevich, explains in his note to this last sentence what the problem was with the uneducated readers that Maimonides mentioned. He wrote, this is my translation, Maimonides' concern was that without the teacher's preparatory introductions, the student will have a premature understanding of the author's intent, and of course, the student will draw the wrong conclusion. Maimonides goes on to say, that contradictions in works of the philosophers are usually of the fifth cause, which is principally educational reasons, but in the guide they'll be found a result from the fifth cause or from the more radical seventh cause. Against Strauss's interpretation of the contradictions, in both of those cases, Maimonides' reason was that beginning students were unqualified for straightforward exposition. However, the main reason for concealment, the one that justified the radical contraries of the seventh kind, was that Jewish law prohibited the public teaching of what Maimonides called the divine science, which included the entire subject 
of Jewish mystical experience and prophecy. However, this divine science was not concerned with philosophy. Maimonides showed this openly when he summarized its relevant doctrines in his famous 26 Propositions of Aristotelian Philosophy at the beginning of Volume 2 of the Guide. He wouldn't have summarized those principles of philosophy there if he was seeking to conceal them. Maimonides did not fear persecution either from the Jewish community, of which he was the leader, or from the Muslims so as to conceal his teachings. His attack on Muslim theology in chapters 71 through 76 of Book 1 of the Guide is not the writing of someone seriously concerned with persecution. I've placed on the screen the divine science topics that Maimonides lists for your review. Maimonides agreed with Jewish law that discussion of these topics should not take place in public. While Jewish law does prohibit the public teaching of divine science, it doesn't prohibit private instruction, and there were famous historical examples of such instruction, such as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his student son Eliezer. The law wasn't concerned with the teaching, but with the student, since the tradition thought that the teaching could be dangerous, possibly life-threatening, to the insufficiently prepared or in immature student. Maimonides sounds this concern for the student again and again throughout the first book of the guide. Moreover, as a believing Jew, there's no reason to think that Maimonides was hiding heretical views on such central questions of Judaism as creation, providence, or the efficacy of prayer. Maimonides would certainly not have thought that the Torah was a noble lie. Maimonides' mild veiling is limited and readily explained by halakhic and educational concerns. He sought to foster the proper education of the public through graduated exposure, since the public was unlikely to be sufficiently prepared or mature at the beginning for such advanced but important topics. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for listening. You may contact me at Scott M. Alexander at rcn.com with comments, criticisms, or questions. Please click on the description panel for this talk on YouTube to see the links to the documents that I've mentioned in this video. Please visit my website, maimonides-guide.com, to see my commentary essays on each chapter of the Guide of the Perplexed, now completed through the entire first volume, together with other associated essays, videos, podcasts, and important links. And of course, please like this video, share it, subscribe, and hit the YouTube notification bell. Thank you very much for listening.